Tag, meine Damen und Herren, ich begrüße Sie ganz herzlich zu unserem allerersten Livestream im Rahmen der Digitaltage 2021 hier vom EMPA Campus in Dübendorf. Heute dreht sich alles um autonome Drohnen, sozusagen lebende Maschinen, künstliche Intelligenz und wie wir dadurch eine nachhaltige Zukunft gestalten können. Die Digitalisierung und die Chancen, die sich dadurch bieten, ist gerade für ein Land wie die Schweiz von enormer Bedeutung. Und es freut mich ganz außerordentlich, dass wir Ihnen heute, aber auch in den kommenden Livestreams einige konkrete Anwendungsbeispiele zeigen können, die wir hier in der EMPA mit unseren über 1000 Forschenden entwickeln. Mein Name ist Michael Hagmann, ich bin Kommunikationsleiter hier an der EMPA und wir sind heute in der Flugarena im Robotikzentrum in Dübendorf. Das ist eine gemeinsame Initiative der EMPA und des Imperial College London. Und mit mir hier ist Mirko Kovac, der sich hier mit Robotik und mit Drohnen beschäftigt und damit, wie man die denn smart und intelligent machen kann. Hallo Mirko, freut Hallo. mich auch. Freut mich auch. Ähm, kurzer Überblick noch, was Sie in der nächsten halben Stunde alles äh, zu erwarten haben. Wir werden natürlich einige Drohnen sehen, hören äh, und bei der Arbeit zuschauen können. Und dadurch werden wir auch live nach London schalten zur zweiten Hälfte von Mirko Kovacs Team. Und die werden uns die Drohnen dann tatsächlich bei der Arbeit äh, demonstrieren. Ähm, und selbstverständlich werden Sie auch äh, Gelegenheit haben, Fragen an Mirko Kovac zu stellen, sei das durch die Chatfunktion, aber auch über E-Mail oder über unsere Social-Media-Kanäle, die äh, am Footer in dem Livestream angegeben sind. Die Fragen werden wir dann nach dem Livestream alle beantworten. Und aufgrund der Partnerschaft mit dem Imperial werden wir Teile dieses Livestreams in Deutsch, andere Teile dann in Englisch machen. Nun zu meinem heutigen Gesprächspartner, Mirko Kovac. And now let's uh, switch to English to also welcome the international audience. Mirko, you are heading the Materials and Robotic uh, and Technology Center for Robotics here at ENPA, but you're also director of the Aerial Robotics Lab at Imperial. That is a rather complicated setup. Um, why did you choose that one? Or in other words, how do you think your research is going to benefit from that? Well, I think it's a complex setup, if you want, but the answer is very simple. And in fact, it connects to the, to the need that robotics has nowadays. And so I grew up in Schaffhausen, here close by, next to EMPA. So I studied at ETH in Zurich. I focused on combustion systems, so a lot of chemistry, fluid mechanics. Then did uh, some, spent some time in the US working on biological cells with fluid mm -hmm. mechanics. Then did a PhD and postdoc on bio-inspired robotics, so flying okay. robots. And in 2012, started a research group at Imperial College in London, where we develop lifelike flying robots. Like the ones we see here. Yeah, so these kind of very small, but also very large robots that can interact with infrastructure, do repair tasks, mm -hmm. environmental sensing tasks. Mm -hmm. So really what inspires me in this is to create artificial life or artificial animals mm -hmm. that are using biological principles okay. of manufacturing, of design, and of uh, control and interaction that can have revolutionary capabilities in robotics. So EMPA has a lot to offer in terms of the material science, and this is something that is really missing in robotics. Okay. And so EMPA Robotics and Aero Robotics Lab and Imperial will merge them and create okay. a marriage that has a, so a lot of potential. So the best of two worlds, so to exactly. say. Okay. Now we'll be talking a lot about artificial intelligence today, uh, so let's start with a seemingly simple question. What to you is actually intelligence? Yeah, so the, the question is actually quite complex in that sense. And intelligence is a very wide term, it's also used in a lot of contexts. It can be, for example, used in fintech or in different economical type of database, decision making and so on, in trading too, mm -hmm. for example. But the general principle is that you take an input from the environment, data or other type of in input, there's some uh, decision making that happens and there is some output that mm -hmm. is put back into the world. Okay. Now in robotics, this means that there is some kind of sensing, perception, some kind of computation and some kind of output to the environment. Reaction, so to say. A reaction, yeah. So in robotics, however, for me what it means is that they have to be engaging with the environment, mm -hmm. they have to move. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. a robot is not a computer, a mm -hmm. robot is, a, is an organism that mm -hmm. moves through complex, unpredictable mm -hmm. environments. Mm -hmm. Well, if one usually thinks of artificial intelligence, AI, uh, one tends to think, or at least I tend to think of Deep Blue, you know, the chess computer, uh, uh, or some other supercomputer that uh, are capable of, you know, billions of calculations within no time. 
what does a, a physical embodiment, uh, our body, have to do with uh, you know, intelligent behavior or the development thereof? So this uh, digital AI, which is based on computation yeah. and database, data processing or classification only, is not enough. So it's really not okay. real, the real intelligence. So let me give you an example for nature of what I consider real intelligence. For example, a bird that wants to fly and land on a surface mm -hmm. has, of course, visual guidance, has mm -hmm. a brain, has a neural system. It has also feet that kind of adapt locally and to grasp and land, but it also has uh, wings. Yeah. And on the wings, there are feathers, for example, and those feathers upright passively. So in a deep storm maneuver, the feathers upright and stop the turbulence yeah. from happening. So they yeah. stabilize the boundary layer yeah. and enhance or expand the operational envelope of the flight performance of the, yeah. of the bird. Yeah. So those feathers do that passively. There's no control mechanism yeah. that sure. controls the feathers. Sure. Instinct, basically. No, it's, a, it's made by the materials, okay. by the morphology. And this level of morphological computation, as yeah. it's also called, or physical intelligence, yeah. um, is needed to be added to the digital intelligence. So okay. the physical and digital intelligence need to work together to enable to make the a real intelligence. intelligence. Yes, yeah, so exactly. to the two together yeah. is the key. Yeah. Okay. Now, we talked a lot about drones uh, and flying robots. We've seen some here, but let's maybe see some more and move over to the flight arena. Okay. Yeah. So this is where it all happens, where you fly your drones, your robots? Yeah, so this is the flight arena where we test a lot of those robots. And the type of robots we have are going from sizes like this, that are small gliding robots, to larger ones, so even very large ones. Some of the bigger ones are 1.5 meters. And I guess we're going to see some of those and in exactly the light. Yeah. Okay. Some. And so what we have to have for that, to test them, to validate them, yeah is to have test beds or representative environments mm -hmm. where they can fly and where we can really uh, study their interaction with the mm -hmm. environment. And basically that's what you're doing here. Exactly, okay. so that's the flight arena that has that. And a few key aspects here is, for example, this bridge element that where we can study how drones would fly together with bridges to repair tasks, okay. measure the corrosion thickness yep. or place sensors and so on. There are also other examples of um, tunneling or mm -hmm. mining where robots can fly in pipelines. So okay. we have that as well. We also have here a water tank as a small one, but we can do uh, air water transitions, for example. And we also have a, a, an, uh, a projection surface, as you see here, where we can show different um, environments and study how robots would engage with those environments using, using visual guidance, for example. So an example um, application could be this uh, wind turbines, where often the wind turbine needs to be sensed or needs to be inspected by the robots and we can study a lot of the visual features of that there. So basically your drones, one of those or whatever, what have you, would sort of fly up to the turbines, of course while it's standing, and then sort of inspecting the blades, see where it needs repair and then do the repair on the spot. Is that sort of the scenario? Yes, yeah, so we call this the 4D inspection. So okay. it's structural inspection from the outside but also the surface, so the thickness of the blade. Are there cracks? Okay. Is there any kind of vibration that should not be there? And also from the outside, but also from the inside. So it needs uh -huh. robots that can physically interact with the surface. Okay. And that's a type of uh, systems that sort are- Sort of broke the developed. surface, if you wish. Probe, yeah. measure the thickness yeah. with okay. the different sensors, okay. uh, interact, land on it, even okay. apply epoxy, for example, from okay. the flight. Some other applications that you think of? Yeah, so other applications include uh, water sampling, and that's, you see on the top right there, yeah. And that's something we are going to see in a second, but also um, others of flying in tunnels or taking environmental readings or data from forests okay. or lakes, okay. for example. I see. Very impressive. Now, what in, in a nutshell would you say makes your um, drones special? Today, drones are used for visual mapping and okay. they use a lot of visual guidance to fly through the environment. Now, we focus on terrain transitions. How can drones transition from air to water? Okay. to surfaces. How can they perch to surfaces? And this terrain transitions are very complex to do, but enable a completely new class of applications. Okay. Okay. So I would say let's see some drones in action, shall we? Great, yes. Okay, yeah. let's go back to our coffee Thank cups, you. and then by now we should have a life link to London. Okay, so we... London, can you hear us? So London, so what is happening now is we have two demos prepared. So one is in London, 
um, in the lab environment, and one is in an outdoor um, in an outdoor environment where we can fly and do water sampling tasks. So can we switch to that? Maybe we can start with the, with the lab test. Oh, oh, no, okay, here it is. Okay, hi everyone. They don't see me, but hi everyone. So this is uh, Silwood Park. Silwood Park is a research campus of Imperial College, which is located next to Heathrow Airport. Not very next, far, far enough away so we don't interfere with aircraft. What we focus on here is to do water sampling. So we have the system, we call it Medusa. It's, based, uh, it's basically a platform that is autonomous, autonomously flying, and it has an underwater pod here that you see. Now it can la fly, land on the water surface and have an underwater robot. So this pod can also be steered in different uh, embodiments of that and so, take uh, water readings. So those are floating devices? Yeah, yeah they, they, these okay. are floating devices. But this one is the pod that has a lot of sensors embedded in it. And I mean, why do we do that? What's the use case? The use case is to do environmental sensing with high spatial temporal resolution, meaning a lot of samples repetitively and very quickly, which is much better than doing it manually. Okay, and basically what you're doing is you're sampling uh, waters, surface waters, like, I don't know, streams, lakes, oceans, these kind of things? Yes, for example, in coral reefs, um, yeah. it's very difficult to know the composition of the water, the pH levels, the temperatures, and there's a real need for new tools, new methods of how to create, how to collect the data from water, water health monitoring data, and so... I think we're about uh, to start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, so... So yeah, we need a lot of uh, the data, and the data is not available, so these type of tools can really help in that. Okay. So this will just take a few seconds here to set up. Um, as I mentioned, it's not... Uh, is, it's it taking, not is it taking off from the water? I can do both. Ah, so okay. I think for the video we now do from the water, okay. just to show the, the takeoff. There's actually quite some complexity of taking off from water. There's ground effect, it can be unstable. If there are waves, it's difficult to take off. And, and so it's also autonomous. So it's an autonomous control system that allows you to fly a certain trajectory take a sample, another sample, and like this, collect a lot of the data and bring it back. And does it, does it decide its trajectory by itself or is it pre-programmed? Do you tell them where to go? So, it, I mean, in this first step, we, uh, uh, we pre-program the trajectory, but um, it can also do certain visual guidance or in interaction with the environment by itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not something we have implemented, but depending on application, uh, we can do one or the other. So basically the thing that is uh, dangling underneath, that is the probe that sort of goes, yes. well, a little submarine, if you, a pot, an uh, underwater exactly, pot. Exactly, yeah. Okay. So th the key is here, it's not just a passive probe that is taken mm -hmm. like this, but it's an underwater robot that has its own buoyancy control system and the, it can move underwater. It's and then tethered to the, to yeah, the copter, exactly. to, the, to, the, to the drone. Okay. And then it can communicate with the, with the surface vehicle uh, to then communicate okay. back to the base station. Okay, great. So it takes a bit of setup. As I mentioned, it's all running on robotic operating systems, on custom also hard, uh, software. So it's not, a, uh, it's not a commercial system. So you cannot buy that. So there's a lot of things that is uh, custom developed and programmed in this. Okay. Okay. Great. So, so let's see. So basically it's a dual uh, drone, if you wish. So the drone as such does not go underwater. No, because I, if I remember correctly, you also had the idea of sort of a, a yeah, diving exactly. drone that sort of goes underwater and then jumps out of the water again. Yeah, exactly. So we have a whole family of aerial aquatic robots. And so, um, oh. yeah, this is one uh, version, which is the, let's say, more applicable or applied version mm -hmm. that is basically a flying platform that has the underwater combination. You can then fly and land. But we also work on others that can fly and dynamically transition to water and out okay. of water. So we have um, four classes of those robots. So basically robots. like one of these sea-dwelling birds that sort yeah. of hover over the water surface and then sort of dive deep into the ocean to catch some prey and then sort of resurface again. It's okay. like a diving birds or flying fish, depends yeah. Yeah. which was <laughs> the focus. <laughs> that you Same have. difference. <laughs> okay. So And now it's touching down or? Yeah, exactly. So what you see here is a is the downwash, so there's some complexity on that if you want to do environmental sensing, so use sensors for detecting that. Um, but we um, can also build on, for example, the diving birds that you mentioned, they yeah. use optic flow-based 
um, navigation. So they expand the visual field to do the landing tasks, and this is something that we also studied. To know where to land, where to best land. No, right. to, to basically know when it when lands. To la when, okay. it, when, when it, it touches, touches ground. Exactly. Okay. And so this can be done with very small sensors. Okay. So we have also by inspired methods of uh, studying that. Now what you don't see here so well is the pod goes underwater, right? So you need to dive. Welcome to join another time and <laughs> here next. Soon. Okay, that gives me an idea for the, our next live stream. We have we'll have two cameras. One is subsurface and the other one above surface, so we can see both. <laughs> so basically, actually, now the pod is is, is being released. Yeah, exactly. And sort of yeah. does whatever it does. And it has an underwater camera, yeah. so you can do a look at um, yeah. pipelines or yeah. any environment there, and you can also. Um, filter the water, so it has live filters to okay. get insights into oh, the water now it's water taking quality. off again. And then it can take off again. Okay, okay I guess we can sh shift to the other team in London. Okay, now we have another link, and this is going to your lab at Imperial, uh, and that looks to me like a, a, a sort of a, a duplicate or a double flight arena, like the one we just saw here at Ampla. Yes, yeah, so there are two complementary laboratories that uh -huh. we have. So this one is focused on motion tracking and on autonomous control and control um, system development. And so here we do more on, like embed, like these test beds of infrastructure, and this is more a test lab for the software. And so this system that we see here is a custom developed platform that has six propellers, so it's a hexacopter, and it has a manipulator on it. A manipulator is uh, something that can manipulate, obviously, <laughs> but it can also stabilize the tip. Okay. So because of that, uh, we can fly. Um, and then manipulate the environment or do uh, repair tasks, uh, spray materials or deposit materials. And this type of interaction and repair capability is really transform transformative for um, like pipeline repair, for example. Mm -hmm. and so. Now, how, how big would that one be here now? So this is about one and a half meters large. So it's about this, this high. So okay. one, oh. it's actually quite big. Quite, platform, quite yeah. big, okay. So that's why we developed it uh, from scratch that it can be Use, uh, built very easily and cheaply. So it's all flat sheets of material that are uh, cut into place. So it's, a, it's basically a base platform that we can then do different tasks with and manipulate the environment. Okay, now the manipulator is also sort of moving back and forth. Okay. Yeah, exactly, so this, uh, the laboratory here is a philanthropic gift from uh, uh, Brahma Vasudevan, who's an alumni from the college. Okay. Um, and he, yeah, so we built this from scratch as well to mm -hmm. um, have a test bed or different environments to test this type of robot. So I'm very excited that we have both now this space in London and also the space here in, mm -hmm. uh, at EMPA to mm -hmm. uh, test this type of robot. Okay, I see. Now we have been talking a lot about nature. Um, uh, some of your drones are inspired by bees. You have very small ones, um, maybe even smaller than the ones we've, we've seen here on the table. Others are more inspired by spiders because they can sort of Tether, be tethered to the wall and then sort of crawl uh, up and down the wall. Would you say that sort of n nature is where you take your uh, inspiration or uh, is your role model? I mean, nature is certainly the role model and it's a source of inspiration too, but it's not limited to nature. We are not, uh, um, we're, we don't stop yeah. at nature. Mm -hmm. So yeah, on one side we don't copy because mm -hmm. we have to understand what is the functional, the useful feature of the yeah. natural system and we extract that and bring it into the robot with the best of yeah. our knowledge. So let's say, for example, this system here, so that's a robo bee that <laughs> robo can bee. Okay. fly in air, fly underwater, and then transition back out of, fly, out of water. So by using uh, hydrolysis and, and hydrogen combustion in this chamber. So that's another example to this Medusa that we've seen. But uh, these are examples of where certain levels of inspiration are taken from nature and then implemented into the robot. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what other sort of applications uh, could you envision while we're at it? So maybe a few other examples include uh, this ones here. So see, the, see here. So this is a robot that can fly outdoors and shoot sensor pods through the environment. So it would place sensors in the like forest. Like darts. Exactly, mean. like darts. Okay. But darts that are um, augmented with certain sensing capability. Like the ones like, you see down there. Yeah, this yeah. is the dart. So it's yeah. a custom electronics that can then be shot into the environment and then send certain features about the forest, for example, temperature, light, and so mm -hmm. on. Okay. To get insights and collect the data to protect the forest. Okay, I see. Does that allude to your statement that uh, drones, autonomous drones, 
could be sort of considered the immune system of our natural world, which I find a rather intriguing uh, metaphor um, for our autonomously living cohabitants. Yeah, so um, what's really important for me is that it's a life supportive application, that it's something okay. that can really help society and be a synergetic uh, mm -hmm. technology to society. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, uh, I think we can think of the drones as residential systems that will live alongside us, okay. alongside our buildings, alongside our uh, wind turbine blades and mm -hmm. facilities, that then do certain inspection, repair tasks. Where, where human workers have a hard time getting to. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like on the, on the tip of a blade, I, I don't know. Yeah, it's quite, it's quite hard, especially yeah. if it's 100 kilometers into the sea. <laughs> so okay. you, really, you really want to avoid to send people exactly. there. Same applies for construction sites that are complex or dangerous yeah. mining environments, yeah. um, uh, nuclear environments, okay. yeah, sure. um, Arctic environments okay. or coral reefs. Hostile in, hostile in any area. way. Yeah, yeah and th okay. there are many of those environments. Okay. And in fact, robotics um, is the technology that can augment that and help humans to be safe yeah. and also be cheaper in the terms of operations, uh, yeah. the capabilities that are there. Okay, okay. Wonderful. Um, now we've covered a lot of ground. I asked a lot of questions. I think uh, that's enough for me to, for today. Now let's just give the audience some um, possibilities to ask some questions. And for this, uh, we switch back to German. Jetzt gehen wir wieder auf Deutsch und schauen mal an, was da alles an Fragen reingekommen sind. Dazu setze ich jetzt doch über meine Brille auf, damit ich das auch besser vorlesen kann. Also Mirko, bist du parat? Ja, ja. <laughs> ah, well, let me just switch back to English because the first question is actually an English question. Danny O'Donoghue asks, what exactly is the difference between physical artificial intelligence and embodied intelligence? Right. Now we're getting very deep into semantics. Yeah, so thank you very much for the question. So physical AI is a, is a term that we have used that describes the co-evolution of different disciplines in the, during the synthesis of a robotic system. Mm -hmm. So if you want to build a lifelike robot, you have to co-evolve the controller, the design, the chemistry, so chemical aspects of it, the control system, the materials to get there. Mm -hmm. So it's focused on multidisciplinary co-evolution and the synthesis process. Now embodied intelligence or morphological computation or physical intelligence are terms that are used in the community quite a lot and are very helpful, but they're principles of how they operate, how certain intelligent decisions can be taken. So an example of morphological computation is the hand, where when you press, it adapts passively. Okay. And this passive adaptation is a key principle of how the hand works. Yeah. So it's not all done with the brain. It happens through the mechanics oh, of the hand. Oh, there is a touch, so I have to clinch my fist. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. it happens also, but it's, it's yeah, just yeah, the sure. design of yeah. the hand yeah. that makes it. Okay. So in that sense, uh, there is the related terms that are synergetic to okay. each other. So, okay, yeah. I see. Um, zweite Frage, wie werden wir Ihrer Meinung nach in Zukunft mit lebenden Maschinen im Alltag zusammenleben? Also day to day, so to say. Yeah, I think it has come to the, it's come to the point of the immune system yeah. and how we the robotic as a synergetic technology can see. What has already happened is that drones are parts of the operational environment and often what is important is the interaction and the security of the interaction. Mm -hmm. What can help in this aspect is interaction. Interfaces, also so ein iPad zum Beispiel, der die Drohne dann operieren kann. Also viel ist, viel Innovation kann passieren auf dem Interface yeah. und der Software Visualization zum Beispiel, yeah. um das dem zu helfen. Mm -hmm. Und das Zweite, was wichtig ist, ist die physische Interaktion, dass die Drohne an sich äh, weich ist oder sicher ist und adaptiv ist. Also die physische Adaption, Adaption kann in dem Sinn auch die Sicherheit erhöhen mm -hmm. in der Interaktion. Mm -hmm. Uh, nächste Frage, eine etwas kritischere. Um, artificial Intelligence, Autonomous Drones und all diese Dinge, uh, so wie du die jetzt dargestellt hast, uh, sind die ja super beneficial, sage ich mal, und, und bringen uns auch tatsächlich als Gesellschaft und als Individuen wahnsinnig viel. Es gibt natürlich auch Menschen, die sagen, ja, diese ganze Art, äh, künstliche Intelligenz, äh, diese äh, Roboter, die dann irgendwann mal so selbstständig werden, naja, dass man sie dann halt nicht mehr kontrollieren kann. Ähm, wie würdest du solchen Argumenten oder Bedenken oder sowas entgegentreten? Ja, also natürlich mit jeder Innovation passiert das. Bei der Dampfmaschine gab es sicher auch Leute, ja, die gesagt natürlich. haben, das ist, 
die Leute ersetzt und so weiter, die Pferde ja. ersetzt. Natürlich Oder ist Roll, es auch äh, Ford, als er die, die äh, Fließbandarbeit und so weiter eingeführt hat. Ja. Äh, Modern Times von Charlie Chaplin, klar. Ja, genau, also ja. das, die, diese, diese Angst vor der Änderung ja. ist natürlich da und ist auch realistisch. Also man ja. muss, das, muss das auch ernst nehmen ja. und ähm, schauen, wie man das ethisch und synergetisch entwickeln kann. Ja. Also es ist nicht zu unterschätzen, das ist auch sehr wichtig. Jetzt ähm, zum Beispiel gibt es diesen Gartner Hype Cycle, wo die Erwartung hoch, hochläuft, gehypt wird ja. und dann die Ernüchterung <lacht> reinkommt und dann das, äh, man sieht, was es nicht kann. Okay. Aber dann gibt es auch diese Performance Phase, wo es zurückkommt. Also zu die dem, Erholung sozusagen nach dem, nach dem Crash. Genau, also die Erholung ja. im Sinne von, es macht Sinn, es, gewisse Applikationen machen Sinn, durch, werden durch die Automation ersetzt ja. oder durch die Robotik ersetzt. Und ich denke, heute, heute sind wir zwei. 2021 sind wir in dieser Performance Phase. Wir sind nicht mehr im Hype, mhm. in der Robotik. Also ja. die Drohnen werden gebraucht, die gehen nicht weg. Die Drohnen werden Teil, Teile davon mhm. sein und werden auch bleiben. Okay. Wann, also Zeithorizont, wann denkst du, dass die ersten wirklich autonomen Drohnen um uns herum schwirren werden, die du dann irgendwie auswerten wirst, deren Daten? Ja, also... Die sind heute schon da. Es gibt äh, Firmen, die konventionelle Drohnen ähm, schon verkaufen, die sehr hohe ähm, Autonomie haben. Okay. Die kann man heute schon kaufen. Was man nicht kaufen kann, sind diese interaktiven ja. oder Terrain, diese Terrain Transitions ja. mit den Drohnen oder Drohnen, die Wassersamples nehmen auf eine autonome Art und, so, ja. Art und Weise. Also es gibt sehr viel Innovationspotenzial in dieser Technologie. Ja. In unserer Arbeit geht es von sehr fundamentaler Wissenschaft in der Materialrobotik bis zu sehr angewandten äh, Beispielen, wie zum Beispiel dieses Water Sampling, ja. das wir gesehen haben. Und in dem Sinne, wir versuchen, das ganze Spektrum abzudecken. Mhm. Okay, mal kurz auf die Uhr schauen. Ja, eine Frage, haben wir noch Zeit? Ähm, Forschung lebt von Nachwuchstalenten, das ist ja immer so. Äh, dein Team ist, glaube ich, auch eher ein junges Team, wenn ich das so äh, sagen darf. Welchen Rat hast du denn für, für, für die nachfolgende Generation, Stud Studenten, PhD-Students, irgendwie so, was, was, was war für dich hilfreich? Also als ich acht Jahre alt war, hab, war ich zu Hause, ich habe gespielt mit diesen Elektromotoren, Batterien okay. und meine eigenen Rak Raketen gebaut und das alles versucht irgendwie zusammenzunehmen, dass man da das zünden kann mit der Batterie oder dass es dann eine Rakete losgeht und so weiter. Du warst damals schon ein kleiner Forscher oder Ingenieur ja, genau. oder sowas. Genau, es ja, war immer ja. dieses... dieses okay. ähm, Bewusstsein, aber auch dieser Wunsch, etwas zu integrieren und zu kreieren. Ja. Also wenn man das spürt in, seinen, in sich selbst, ja. dann äh, sollte man dem folgen ja. und einen Ort finden, wo dem Ausdruck gegeben werden kann. Und das ausleben kann sozusagen. Genau, ob man das jetzt als Kind macht oder ja. als in der Ausbildung, im Studium, durch ja. Projektarbeit, durch Group Design Projects, ja. die wir auch unterstützen durchs Labor, oder in einem Doktorat oder auch später ja. als Professor. Ja. Also der, der Kern bleibt vom Kreator und was wichtig ist in dem Sinn, ist, das nicht zu unterdrücken, sondern dem zu folgen. Jetzt habe ich gerade eine neue Frage reingekriegt. Okay. Dann nehmen wir die doch tat noch, tatsächlich noch. Ähm, wie, teuer, oh, äh, wie teuer ist eine Drohne wie die, die aus dem Wasser gestartet ist? Ist sie bereits bei Schweizer Firmen oder in der Schweiz im Einsatz? Und wenn ja, bei welchen? Ah, sehr gute Frage. Also ich würde vorschlagen, dass Sie ein E-Mail schreiben. <lacht> also wir können das natürlich. Okay. Es, ist eine, es ist nicht ein kommerzielles Produkt heute, ja. aber wir ähm, machen Case Studies äh, mit diesen Drohnen, mit Partnern in, den, in der Wasserwirtschaft, Wasserwissenschaft oder auch ähm, Wasserhygiene, mhm. um da diese, diese Methodologie zu testen, zu validieren und dann das auch anzubieten mhm. in Kollaboration mit anderen Partnern. Ha, habt ihr viele Industriekollaborationen? Äh, ja, ja, es gibt sehr viel Interesse okay. in diesem ganzen Gebiet von Wasser, Health, ja. okay. Wassergesundheit. Also Ökosystem, Ökosystem, Analyse, Monitoring, sowas in der Richtung. Okay. Ja, genau. Wieder zurück zu diesem Immunsystem, ja. dass die Drohne da ist und wenn etwas passieren würde, dass die Drohne dann schnell die Daten sammeln kann ja. und so eine viel schnellere Reaktion zu einem Ereignis ähm, beigetragen werden kann. So das, war ja auch, das war ja, glaube ich, auch die Idee Drohnen. dieser Drohnen in den Wäldern, dass die im Prinzip gucken kann, wie, wie, wie geht es dem Wald? Ja, äh, genau. Auch vielleicht als Response zum Klimawandel oder irgendwie. So genau. In die Richtung. Genau, also ja. die Daten zu sammeln, so schnell wie möglich, so präzise wie möglich ja. und so oft wie möglich. Ja. Ja. Und das ist wirklich das, was die Drohnen oder die Roboter okay. generell machen kann oder beitragen kann. Okay. Super. Super. Ich glaube, wir kommen so langsam ans Ende unseres Livestreams. 
äh, bleibt mir nur mich ganz herzlich bei dir, Mirko, und bei deinem ganzen Team, vor allem die Leute in London, Extend My Gratitude, äh, zu bedanken. Und natürlich auch bei Ihnen, meine Zuschauerinnen und Zuschauer. Ähm, ich hoffe, dass wir einige Ihrer Fragen beantworten konnten. Und ähm, ich hoffe, dass ich Sie auch beim nächsten Mal, beim nächsten Livestream äh, begrüßen darf. Das wäre am 2. November, wieder um 14.30 Uhr. Und da werde ich mit der EMPA Mobilitätsforscherin Miriam Elsner über autonome Autos, also was related, but not the same, autonom fahrende Autos äh, sprechen. Wir werden uns eins anschauen und nicht nur das, wir werden sogar in einem fahren oder uns fahren lassen. Ähm, und Sie können uns dabei über die Schulter schauen. Würde mich freuen, wenn Sie dabei sind. In diesem Sinne, tschüss, ade und noch einen wunderschönen Nachmittag. <lacht>